coming up on Peninsula Beat, a special gathering for RPV's new city manager. NFL Hall of Famers come out for a local charity event and a story with lots of splash at the Terranea Resort. RPV's new city manager, Doug Wilmore, was the guest of honor at a special community leaders meeting. Liz Brown Swanson joins us from the gathering held at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. Liz. Thanks, Maria. I'm here at PVIC on a gorgeous day, I must add, where the city council hosted a very special community leaders meeting to give our new city manager, Doug Wilmore, the opportunity to officially meet many of our community leaders. We've had in the past leadership breakfasts to bring the leaders of the community together for some things that we want to kind of share and collect with together. I thought it'd be important for everybody to get a chance to meet the new city manager have a chance for him to say a few words and people can ask some questions and we can see where his vision is and uh, where we want to go with the city. So many great people, great citizens, great staff members, and at the same time there's a lot to do. I mean, I always believe as good as you are, you can always get better. Especially, I think, improve customer service to our citizens. I want to find ways to help city services be more accessible, be quicker, be faster be more efficient and things like that. When you have a change in the biggest city on the hill, um, the leadership is so important and this, this city manager, Doug Wilmore, comes with a great deal of wonderful credentials. He's made tremendous in strides. Every week we get an administrative report. Now it's online and the public can find that out. Um, he's made it so that we have opportunities amongst ourselves to work toward goals, which is what we just did. Probably the best goal setting exercise ever. People always ask me, what, what's my focus and what are my priorities? And first thing I tell them is I work for the city council. And I say that not out of sort of passing the buck. I say it really out of respect. I have a lot of respect for people who put their name on the ballot. And having said that, you know, I really believe that whatever we do, we ought to try and be the best at it. I've heard a lot about public safety while I've been here, so what can we do to make the community safer? Enjoyed meeting Mr. Wilmore, in fact, gave him a tour of uh, Lameda Sheriff Station. You know, crime is a, a, an issue that, uh, and public safety in general is an issue that's of concern to, you know, everyone, regardless of where you live, and uh, it's no different here on the peninsula. And, you know, we'll continue to do a, a wonderful job with uh, you know, his support and the support of the City Council in addressing those issues that are of concern to the community that impact quality of life and, and public safety. I know that Doug is thrilled to be here. He is really excited about making a difference and an impact in the city and for the people of RPV. Um, he gets to come to this gorgeous slice of heaven every day and he loves the people that he's working with and is just committed to making a difference. One of the unique things about RPV for me is it was a community, the first community that I've worked with that I was already in love with before I even considered working here. We fell in love here, got married here, been, you know, been the proverbial outsiders who recreated in the community all the time. And uh, so we know RPV well and truly love it. So our new city manager has officially been on the job since March 1st, but all the leaders here said he's already accomplished many things, including his goal, which is to continue to preserve the beautiful city that Rancho Palos Verdes is. Back to you, Maria, in the studio. Mr. Wilmore also emphasized his open door policy and encourages residents to contact him about any issue or concern. Earth Day has been celebrated with all kind of events, so what do sea lions and sea salt have in common? Well, they were all part of an exciting Earth Day festivities held at the Terranea Resort. Liz Brown Swanson has more on the story. Hi, Maria. Well, it was beautiful here at Terranea Resort on Earth Day. So many exciting festivities, starting off down at Terranea Cove, where the guests and the community were able to watch two sea lions being released back into the wild, and then ending up at a very special celebration where the guests got a taste of the sea as Terranea unveiled the opening of their new Sea Salt Conservatory. First, I think we have to look at our main suppliers of beautiful water, the gorgeous Pacific Ocean right behind us. And from there, that's where our story starts, we begin. So we go to the beach, to the Terranea Cove, and we bring the water from the Pacific Ocean. And then we put in our new salt pond. 
Uh, we're very excited about it. What's going to happen is we're going to let Mother Nature take her course. And with her help and lots of sun and some wind, the water will evaporate and provide us with beautiful terra nea sea salt. We will produce hundreds of pounds of salt and we'll use it in savory cooking as you would think usually you use salt, but we use it in sweets. We'll be using it down in the spa with salt rubs and just a variety of different ways, salt soaps, and so it's really amazing what you can use salt for. Really excited about it. Of all places to be on Earth Day, it's gorgeous obviously. You have the ocean, uh, we're checking out the Sea Salt Conservatory which is amazing and we got to see the whole ribbon cutting ceremony which is fun. And they're having you sample uh, beautiful delicious hors d'oeuvres and whatnot with the sea salt. Have you tried anything yet? Yes, in fact, Tell me what you've tried. The um, savory muffin, that's pretty delicious. The food is excellent, the service, everybody is so kind and what Terranea does for the community and for voluntary services, the things that they produce and care about. They grow their own, a lot of their own herbs and foods and now the sea salt. This is fabulous. Hi, my name is David Bard. I'm the operations director at the Marine Mammal Care Center at Fort MacArthur. We have two California sea lions who are getting released back to their natural environment today. Um, these animals have been coming in in great numbers since January. We've seen over 450 of them, um, which is typically what we see all year and that's just in, in three or four months. Um, these animals uh, generally come in malnourished, dehydrated. Um, they should be coming in about twice uh, or three times the weight that we're seeing them at. And right now we've got two who have been successfully treated and are ready to go home. All right, big moment. And there they go. It was just so special. It was so cute to see them. They were really, really playful, uh, you know, both excited and, and ready to go to the ocean. And it was just, it was really, really, really cool. No matter how many times you see it, when animals truly get out in the wild, it gives you goosebumps. It's been a really surprisingly moving morning. So thanks to the Marine Mammal Care Center for uh, giving us the privilege of releasing them here. And we will do it again as soon as we have animals that are well enough to go. The community definitely enjoyed oceans of fun here at Terranea on Earth Day. But no doubt when you walk along this beautiful coastal resort, it feels like Earth Day every day of the year. Back to you, Maria, in the studio. The PV Arts Center offers a wide range of classes. Recently, a Hopi Native American traveled all the way from his reservation in Arizona to teach a class on ceramics and pottery in the classic tradition of his culture. The class took place at Cabrillo Beach in San Pedro. Here's more from Mark J. Dottie. This is pretty neat. For the first time, I get to report this story barefoot because we're here at Cabrillo Beach where the PV Art Center is teaching a class on pottery. It'll take you back in time before the invention of the kiln. My name is Mark Tabo. I'm a Hopitewa Indian, a Native American from um, First Mesa, also known in, as Palaka in Arizona, northeastern part of Arizona. It's a very still conservative, very old village that I come from. And the process that I've learned and do the craft that I have is making Hopitewa pottery. And to bring and to be asked to do this, you know, is something I always talk about being a gift bestowed upon me, that it is not mine to hoard or to be selfish with it's to walk all over life with no matter who I meet to share this gift of creativity that I have to others and to be here to have this what's happening here is such a momentum momentous moment in my potting career with the class we usually start off with getting ourselves introduced about myself small first briefly and then about the clay processes and where the clay comes from what materials and pigments everything is used Use. basically everything we found out through the class and through students talking about it is that you know it's all organic everything is organic down to the paint down to the last of the firing which is th used through sheep manure sheep tends to burn much hotter it's it's one of the most hot one of the hottest fuel that Native Americans use to cook uh, pottery so it reaches roughly we could say maybe here we might touch maybe 900 degrees you know somewhere because of um, of the baldness in, in how much we fire for a class I normally don't fire this many pieces at home too so it's a little uh, interesting process for me too to see that uh, you know abundance can be put in at once everything we do here 
is what we do at home. There's not nothing that we didn't bring from home that's going to be used today on the beach. Now, this is a this is an example of my um, apprentice uh, Jerome, who has mm -hmm. been apprenticing me, under me for about four years and now. He's back there feeding yeah, the fire. Yeah, right he's now. the one that's attending the mm -hmm. fire right now. But uh, we, as we were getting into what we were going to do and how the firing was going to take place, I said, "Well, why don't you make something that would be appropriate to what we're doing, and it would be a water canteen, maybe possibly in ancient." times the native traveled here but the canteens would be much larger of course and they would maybe take water you know from that put it on their backs and then go on their journeys and uh, how have you seen the pottery class that you've so far has it been a success do you think you'll do this again next year oh i think it's a home run i i can't wait to see it grow and and uh, expand for next year when, when you see the love and care of of the potter uh and and the cultural transfer of knowledge I mean, it's 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 such a unique opportunity for students to to really understand the, the art form. Uh, and when I watched uh, students make yucca brushes and pull those lines, it's just absolutely amazing. So uh, my wish is that everyone has the, this experience. And then, you know, the added bonus of coming to the beach and firing, doing a pit firing right here on the sand is very very cool. And if somebody wants to keep up with the PV Art Center and maybe track this class and see when it's coming up next, where do they go? Well, uh, follow our website, watch for the class announcement on our website, and also uh, in our class schedules, which uh, are published uh, uh, four times a year, and they're going to appear in your mailbox, so you're not going to miss it. And when we come back, it was a three-ring circus for one of our charities here on the Hill, while some Hall of Famers came out to support Freedom For You. We'll be right back. The Point Vicente Interpretive Center offers a variety of attractions. Today, John Clayton will take us behind the glass and give us a front row view of an almost 200-year-old whaleboat located on the ocean side of the property. It's time to sail away with John Clayton. Well, here we are at the Point Vincendi Interpretive Center on a beautiful Chamber of Commerce day, and I feel in this location that I'm getting ready to go and imitate Moby Dick. We're going to be talking with Robert Barry, who is an expert on this wonderful uh, vehicle, I guess, here. And Robert is an expert, so first of all, welcome. Tell me a little bit about this. Uh, is this a whaling boat? What is this? This is a whale boat. This is not a whaling ship. This is... Uh this is what we call a Yankee whale boat. It, uh, it developed over time, approximately 1740, when the uh, whaling had to go out in deep into the Pacific. So they had to get a standard boat. It is, uh, the, the design hasn't changed in over 200 years, over 200 years. This is uh, uh, 28 foot long, six and a half foot wide. Okay, there is, there is five uh, sailors and one captain. And these fearsome looking things here, are my, it's probably my British sense of humor, but when I first saw them, I think to myself, you know, in the old days, that's how they did dental surgery, but <laughs> obviously that is not what it is. But what are these? Well, these, these are harpoons, and this is uh, one of the uh, latest designs before they went into uh, shooting cannons off of the modern sh uh, ships. Before we go any further, you said the latest design. <laughs> I mean, what what year? What year will we be talking about? About 1800. Okay. This, this the, uh, the toggle harpoon, and it uh, is designed to go in, and then this little pin breaks off, and it's uh, it locks onto the blubber. But you would have to get this boat very close to the whale so that they could throw it, right? I mean, there was no sort of explosive charge that this came, it was purely manpower that threw it into the whale. Purely manpower. And the idea was to get right next to the whale and to insert it into the blubber, not to, uh, not to kill the whale or anything like that. It was just to attach it to the whale. And they just so they did carry water for them to drink? They carry enough uh, supplies for a sailor to keep, uh, between, keep themselves for f five to ten days. 
So, uh, what a fascinating trip this has been. I know we haven't actually gone to see in it. And if you want to see this for yourself, come on down to the Point Vincendi Interpretive Center. Come on down and experience this 100 plus year old boat that is absolutely fascinating. And we'll see you next time, maybe not on a whale boat, but certainly in another very interesting show. Take care and thanks so much for watching. The PV Juniors held their annual fundraiser in the South Bay. The organization raises money to support women and children's charities. And these ladies work hard all year to make this event a success. Here's more. Uh, as you know, this is a fundraiser and the PV Juniors uh, work to help out uh, women and children in crisis throughout the South Bay. And this is a fundraising event. The whole idea is to raise as much money as possible. There were more baskets than I could count last night, gifts for the silent auction, and then they have you know, eight or ten live auction items that are very high end and uh, hopefully will raise a lot of money. Our um, mission is to help women and children in crises in the South Bay, and that's typically through Rainbow Shelter and to other um, Toberman House, where children and uh, women need assistance from other funding other than their own personal uh, charity or philanthropy organization. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, but most importantly, it takes everybody's heart. And without that engagement and without that dedication, it just would not be pulled off. The amount of hours and effort it takes from the entire membership is just not duplicated in any workforce that I've ever been in. I watch all these ladies work really, really hard. Um, I witnessed it firsthand the last couple of years. My house has served as a staging area. As a matter of fact, we had uh, one lovely lady at my house till about 3.30 last night preparing for this event. So Leslie. my hat's off. My hat's off to them. Leslie Lowe, who was... Uh, in charge of auction. She was in charge of auction. And let me tell you, Mark, it's just, it's unbelievable how hard these ladies work. And, you know, the, the ladies and the kids are really the beneficiaries of that. So. Yeah, this is all volunteer, right? Nonprofit. Nonprofit, 100% volunteer. And, and it's amazing how deep people dig into their pockets and how generous they are both in, in you know, with, with uh, in deed and spirit and with actual items. What's the theme of tonight's event? It's called Cirque du Soire. It's kind of a play on Cirque du Soleil. And we're going to have, as you see, some stilt walkers. When you enter the room, you're going to be blown away. It's like a circus tent with lights and colors. And we'll have another circus act. We'll have a ringmaster in the middle, sort of organizing it all. And it won't be your traditional people at the stage. It's going to be somebody in the middle of this room. And while many people find themselves plagued with back issues, we meet up with a local Palos Verdes chiropractor who is bringing back a century-old technique to get your back on track. Here's more with Mark J. Dottie. We're here at the Carson Plaza, where an RPV resident has perfected a hundred-year-old chiropractic technique that may be new to you. So let's go check it out. The procedure actually was developed in the 30s by B.J. Palmer in Davenport, Iowa, and then it kind of lost its way over time, and just recently, last 15 years, it's made a resurgence, especially in the last five years, because there's been a lot of landmark research coming out, which is catching people's attention. Cervical refers to neck. Uh, in the upper cervical office, we see patients with every condition you can think of, so generally the public thinks of chiropractic as a pain treatment system uh, and our rationale for what we do is the central nervous system which is composed of the brain and the spinal cord which passes down inside of the vertebra so our specialty is determining which one of these vertebra is misaligned out of position uh, and the way that we do that we take very precise three-dimensional x-rays and once we have that information then we make a very precise correction we're correcting a spinal misalignment which creates pressure to allow the body to function better and the end result of that those problems that people have many times they clear up because the body writes itself and then dr drew was kind enough to take me through this process the first thing he did was ask me about my physical history and I explained how i carry heavy camera equipment all the time the next thing he did was a neck graph 
followed by a table examination where he was able to examine if I was out of alignment. As you can see, I was a little out of whack. Then it was time for the x-ray, which allowed Dr. Hall to see precisely how the atlas had misaligned relative to the skull. And after the x-rays were taken, precise measurements were taken that are used in the spinal correction. Then he placed me back on the table where a final adjustment could be made. They ordered me to rest for 15 minutes. A week later, I returned and got my checkup. Let's find out how it went. He looks perfectly balanced there. So you held your adjustment, that's good news. When I came here the first time, we re reviewed the tape and yeah, there's like a lot of distance between my feet. He showed me, uh, Rocco showed me back at the studio. So what are we looking at now? What did you just see? So this is called a prone leg balance check and what you're showing is your legs are completely even and that's an indicator that the atlas that was locked under the skull is now in its normal range of motion. There's no stress or strain on the cord and as a consequence the muscles on both sides of the spine are now balanced which that's why your legs are showing balance. Great. Hey, so I'm level-headed, would it be? Your head is now on straight. Ah, that's better. Thanks, Dr. Drew. I didn't even know this existed until today, but I'm really glad I found out that I had some kind of unlevel feet going on there and uh, some back problems. So hopefully this is going to help me out, and if you're interested, the website's on your screen. And uh, come on down and check it out. And in sports, there is a local charity here on the Hill that brings out Hall of Fame athletes every year. Over at the PV Golf Club, Freedom For You celebrated its annual fundraiser with some very special guests. Here's more. Freedom For You is a youth nonprofit organization and our focus is helping teens find their passion and their purpose in life. And uh, we feel if they do that, it's going to prevent a lot of risky behavior that goes on and uh, serious problems that can happen with kids. So it's really like a preventative kind of focus. And the key for the future is the young kids today. If you don't help them, you don't train them, you don't teach them, and there's no future for them. So uh, the Raiders have always been involved with, with this kind of a fundraiser because uh, there's a need for it. That's right. And so have I. I've been involved uh, for many years with this kind of function. So uh, I think it's great, you know, to try to have it every year and uh, because the young kids, they need guidance, they need help, and uh, they need someone to put them in the right direction and keep them in the right direction. My kids, that they're always doing something to help the community, keep the community strong. I mean, that's what life is about. We all have things we can give. Well, yeah, because if you don't teach them, young people, how to play fair, how to play according to the rules, they mess them up. And when you see guys on the field breaking the rules, well, that tells the kids that I can do that too. And that's what you try to do, is try to impress the young people, the fact that it's important that you play by the rules, otherwise you lose the game. Freedom for You makes such a difference for this community and our young people. Um, we're just very, very lucky to have um, Greg and this organization supporting our students. He has um, after school programs at the library, keeping kids out of trouble um, with constructive things to do. He offers counseling for our students and yes, students at Peninsula High School sometimes are caught drinking or with drugs. I hate to admit it, but it is life. It's the truth. And he offers the counseling required, um, the follow-up counseling. He is um, always there to support us in everything we do. And the way that Freedom For You impacts Palos Verdes High School, it's a direct, everyday impact. It's a positive impact. Evan Papadakis is the counselor who comes onto our campus for Freedom For You, and he meets with almost 35 students. And that's 35 students per semester, and that's on top of other students that he counsels. And every one of those students turn around their lives, and, and it's, it's really powerful. And I think, I can't thank Greg Allen enough and Freedom For You. Um, our work is, you know, we're running a school, but yet at the same time, Greg allows us to be able to help all the students who have 
some struggles and challenges, and um, it's a major problem. We work with a lot of students who Greg works with. Um, they're you know further on the continuum, uh, but they're healthy kids, uh, lots of times musicians, and they come from Greg's program to to the university. Uh, yeah, it's a one great continuum of working with kids, and I'm very happy to be here tonight to cheer Greg on. You see, when someone you see the light turn on when they find something they care about, mm -hmm. something they're interested in, and they have a purpose, and that's what we're trying to do. That's why our theme tonight is releasing youth. So it's releasing their their passion, their identity, their the things they care about, and having them exercise their abilities in their in their lives. And finally, over at Rolling Hills Prep, we found some very motivated students who raised money for Special Olympics by selling baked goods. And they recently presented a check for $500 to the Special Olympics organization. Here's more from the school. So we have morning meeting where students and teachers make announcements and we have two schools on this campus, Rolling Hills Prep and Renaissance School. So all the students get together, we hear the weekly announcements and then at the end of this meeting, Cakes for Causes made their donation to Special Olympics for $500. Um, thanks to you guys, we were able to raise $500 for Special Olympics and this allows us to sponsor an athlete for two seasons and that's including training, competition, transportation, and uniform. So we just want to thank you guys for all your support. I started Case for Causes because something similar was at my old school and so we each bring like uh, two or three different um, go like baked goods. So some of us will bring brownies or cookies, and then we just go around the school trying to sell them. And kids are really into the food, so that's how we sell that much. Some of our stuff's made. Um, like Phoebe, one of our uh, members, she has really good brownies, and those sell well. But other stuff we just buy from like Vons or Ralphs. Um, every other week, I made brownies that my mom always makes. <laughs> they, I think it was because they're really like thick and big brownies. And they're brownies and everyone likes chocolate. <laughs> well, $500 actually sponsors one athlete for one full year of sports training. Um, so the way our program is set up is uh, our year is divided into two seasons. So that allows the athlete to practice uh, two separate sports within one year. Um, and that includes weekly practices and competitions, uniforms, transportation to competitions, uh, which could be anywhere in the Southern California footprint. I have started with Special Olympics for 13 years, and the uh, first sport that I played was swimming, and I was really motivated by somebody who's in my family, so I'm really happy to be involved. Well, let's just say this is through uh, swimming for a while, because I started that before sp basketball. I mostly get, get um, the bronze or the, um, med or the um, gold sometimes, but I also get a ribbon. Um, Kayla used to be shy and it's given her opportunities to try new things, not to be afraid of new sports. She can go out there, it's a safe environment. She makes friends, um, it's a very supportive environment. And everywhere she goes, she feels very welcomed and loving. Um, so it's not a place where people get rejected and are afraid to try anything. Um, Kaylee's not shy at all, she's been given the opportunity to be a global messenger for Special Olympics, which means she goes and speaks at different events. And um, so she's been trained in how to public speaking. So it's much more than just sports training. Um, now she's the, the receptionist for the World Games, for Special Olympic World Games coming this summer. And every day she wakes up so excited um, for what the, the day is going to bring her. Her staff welcomes her and encourages her to grow and to be her best. <laughs> How that goes. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> A very worthwhile cause for sure. And that will do it for us. From everyone here at RPV TV, make it a great day.